Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another fun episode of the Cup Duet Reviews. And we're shaking it up a little bit this time, as Jill and Ryan are off in jolly old England. And so we are doing our first ever duet review review episode with a guest co-host of the episode. And joining us as our inaugural co-host guest episode of a duet review is the wonderful Alicia Plummer. Hello, Alicia. Hello. Hi, Mackenzie. It's lovely to be here. Very happy that you reached yes. out. And I'm always down for a cup review. Always. <laughs> so this is awesome. You're wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you for answering the call or the bat signal. Or I guess in this case, <laughs> like the airplane ticket to take <laughs> off on this adventure, you know. And what's in your cup today? What is in my cup, you ask? Just plain old water. I threw some nice. ice in there. Of course, you can't see it anymore. It's melted. It's all melted. <laughs> but I'm just trying to stay hydrated. So that's what Very I'm drinking. Good. Very <laughs> good. And I am drinking some orange passion fruit crystal light tonight. So Ooh. there we go. And then, Alicia, because this is a travel piece, mm. what is being your favorite place that you have traveled to? Oh my gosh, what a fun question. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would definitely have to be South Korea. Ooh. So I went to, yeah, mm-hmm. I went to South Korea in September. Mm-hmm. And every I think about it every day and how I need to go back because I was only there for like 10 days. And I just wish I stayed for about a month or maybe even two months to see mm-hmm. everything. So that, that was my, that would definitely be my favorite travel destination so far. I love that. I love that. I love that. And I'd say for me, my favorite place has been England. Like I've been to London now twice. I've done London twice and I would love to go back again for a third trip because there's just so much theater, so much culture, history Mm -hmm. there. And then also you could branch out from London and go and visit a whole bunch of other places. Like one of my favorite all time trips I ever did was when I did Wales and Ireland for two weeks. And we did like almost 40 castles in two weeks going through everything. And it was just incredible. So, I mean, I love good old history and that was just such a great trip mm-hmm. but what spurred that question is the show we're talking about today that is currently playing at crow's theater and it is called perceptual archaeology or how to travel blind and it was written and performed by alex bulmer directed by leah cherniak and it also featured a fellow performer in line theater named enzo masara and so this piece opened last night And it will be running from June the 1st to June 25th. And it was just a wonderful night out. And we will have a spoiler section because this piece is split into five arcs or five parts, kind of like the five elements of a story, you know, Uh, the five acts of of, of a story uh, or a hero's journey, as it were. And so we will kind of get into all that once we kind of get past the spoiler plane as it were this time around this time we have a spoiler break because it's all about traveling but before we do that we'll get into some of our more general thoughts about this piece and so alicia for you what were your thoughts on the this two i mean i mean it's billed as a one-hander but Mm -hmm. really after watching the show you could almost dare to call it a two-hander with how much enzo and and alex really do interact throughout this piece and bounce off each other. So what something like what, kind of like what were your thoughts of our two performers? My thoughts honestly were I was a bit surprised at how humorous it was. Mm-hmm. So I I really enjoyed that. I find that mm-hmm. sometimes theater in Toronto mm-hmm. or theater in Ontario in general can sometimes be very dark and brooding and we live in a dark time. Long. <laughs> we live in, we live in a dark time very true but and also it can also theater can just be long so that i mm-hmm. so going into this show i kind of had like fresh eyes i also didn't do too much research before i just kind of was like oh mackenzie's inviting me to review a show <laughs> i'm obviously i'm going but yeah it was humorous it was interactive in a way that i wasn't mm-hmm. expecting it to be very mm-hmm. creative I think the playwright slash actor Alex Bulmer did a wonderful job. Mm-hmm. It in a in a general sense, leaving the theater, I was 
pleasant, I guess, pleasantly surprised in a way of, A, I, I walked in not knowing exactly what to expect. Mm-hmm. And B, I walked out feeling a sense of ease and a sense of, I'm so happy that I saw this piece. I, I felt like mm-hmm. I immediately wanted to tell people you should probably look this up. You need to, I also wanted to do more research on it, on her, seeing it as it is a biography type of show of her talk, talking about her life and her experience. So I hope this is, I hope I'm not giving too much away as of yet. I'm just, no. these are thoughts <laughs> that I found yeah. after watching the performance. Mm-hmm. How about you? I mean, once again, so we got the invite and I mean, I have the travel bug within me. I love to get on a plane and go, explore places go go read the history and all that type of stuff so for me this piece automatically was like fascinating and then as we should say alex is a visually impaired blind performer she lost her sight i think she says in the show at 29 so 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 something that was a genetic deterioration of the eyes and so she performs this piece with the cane as well as with support from enzo and the audience as well and i would just say she's a natural on that stage like she has just such a natural comfortability being in it like being in, like being in a space and just telling a story like she's interactive mm-hmm. i like one of the things you and i were saying to each other afterwards was because enzo is reading lines to, into an earpiece for her is how much of that was improv and she and how much of that was her actually interacting with enzo uh mm-hmm. for the show because they were just so natural together, bouncing off each other. And it was very kind of just an, a, a flowing piece. There was no real lull in the show. And she really did bring emotional depth. Like there were like there were moments when like her character when she herself in the show, as she's retelling her travel log, felt overwhelmed and wanted to shut down for a minute and had Enzo take mm-hmm. over the dialogue for a bit for her. Like once again, it was all very well put together and she just had such a natural gregarious energy that was just so inviting that you really did want to root for her as she's going on this journey. And, you know, I mean, this journey, I mean, we can kind of give a brief summary of the show is so Alex starts the piece talking about how she was running into things and then basically she went to the hospital and they said you will lose your eyes say between five to 50 years, nine years after the diagnosis, she officially loses her sight. And then after that, she then is left to kind of explore and figure out what she wants to do. And so she was floating in a pool. And so she thought to herself, she wants to go travel, see the world. And so then she's off and uh, off. And then she looked up blind travel writers. And sure enough, she came across Kind of our third unseen character, the piece was somebody we hear a lot about, which is this British explorer of the who's part of Royal Society, and his name was James Holman, and he was a blind captain and explorer who would who who went to see the world. However, because he was blind and visually impaired, other explorers of the time discredited him, saying, "How can anyone who is visually impaired or blind actually give a proper?" depiction of what these places are and so basically they destroyed and discredited his work and so alex then applied for funding so she could do a project where she kind of traveled in his footsteps and kind of was able to retrace some of his explorations and so from there she then got to travel all over the world and we'll kind of leave the plot up there like we won't kind of give more away Mm -hmm. until after the spoiler plane goes up but I mean, once again, Alex is telling this really beautiful personal story in such a authentic way. Like she's not, I, I, I never felt like she was putting on a show. It more felt like you were someone who was invited into a living room and she was just going to be telling you about what she, what, what, kind of her journey through, through these travels that she went on. And so and it was just a really well done, well written, composed piece by Alex. And then you know, Enzo was right there with her. I mean, he mm-hmm. opens the show by giving a visual description because this was a very accessible performance. Like we had other members of the visually impaired and blind community. We had people who had physical disabilities as well as we had people with hearing disabilities as well. And so they were all part of the audience and they were all very interactive and very exciting, excited to be there as well and very supportive 
of Alex in this story, which was beautiful. And it was great to see such great, wonderful representation on stage. Because as you said, this could have been a very dark, very sad story about someone who loses their mm -hmm. their sight at a relatively young age. I mean, she was our age. I mean, I'm 29. So it's one of those things that, you know, see most of your life and then you lose that ability. You could have gone to a very dark, sad show, but she really brought light to it. Like she brought hope and optimism. She, I, I've never once did I feel like she was saying, pity me for what I'm going through. Instead, she was being actively encouraging, saying, no, I'm not going to let this prevent me from doing something I love to do which is to travel and see the world and be, an active, and be active in that. So I really did appreciate the show for that in such a positive representation of the blind and visually impaired community. It was really beautiful. And so it was great as well. And so, yeah, so I mean, the, the both Enzo and Alex had such beautiful chemistry. I think, I think my favorite scene of theirs is when they get, is when they do a polka together and she made a comment <laughs> that Alex or, or Enzo always missed these rehearsal sessions. So he was kind of, Catching up to what had a polka, but they were great together, so it was lovely. Were there any favorite production or design elements for you, Alicia, that stood out? Yeah, actually, there was. A, I also had a similar reaction to one of the mm -hmm. dancing scenes. Mm -hmm. For me, I think my favorite part of the play itself was when there's a moment when Alex starts waltzing on her own mm -hmm. and. Then she invites Enzo to waltz with her, <laughs> but then she specifies, no, you can still waltz, but not with me in your own, yes, <laughs> in your corner. <laughs> yeah. So I just found that really funny and sweet. Mm -hmm. And then they both just started to waltz. Yes. And just that tempo change of that slow, mm -hmm. beautiful movement really just made me smile. And their eyes mm -hmm. were closed as well. So it felt like yeah. they were connected and just little directing things like that in terms of just uh, the I'm basically I'm trying to say like I I love that the play touched on sensory and mm -hmm. there were different elements where there are moments mm -hmm. when Alex and Enzo weren't on stage and we could just hear the lines being said and yes. we're just seeing the blank stage and taking everything in our own way and I think that's beautiful because that's accessible for other people when mm -hmm. it's just you're just listening to the words and you're not necessarily seeing what's happening as you mm -hmm. mentioned Mackenzie Alex is a visually impaired, impaired woman but she's so inspiring so uplifting mm -hmm. and I personally would love to sit down and have a conversation with her because <laughs> she just yes. seems just very genuine agreed agreed I will tag team on the sensory stuff because I really want to give a shout out to our sound technician hold on here let me make sure i get the name right oh sorry and also sound designer so mm -hmm. sound design was done by deanna h Choi, and our sound technician was river oliviera mm -hmm. and they worked really well together because it's one thing to design the soundscape but then having to place those speakers in such a way that you really feel the sound reverberating in different spaces so there, there's like two key moments that I'm not going to, uh, that I'll mention, but I won't go into detail about them. There's one mm -hmm. where we feel we're in water. And there's another moment where you feel the claustrophobia of being in a very packed, crowded square. And both those moments, sound-wise, gave me two viscerally different experiences. The water made me relax. The sound of the crowd made me very tense and very uncomfortable. And it really made you connect with what Alex was describing and feeling as she's retelling the story. So I was really, really impressed with how well this sound design worked in tandem with the story to really, once again, evoke those, excuse me, evoke those sensory feelings that you have. I mean, there's always the adage that I'm pretty sure it's being disproven, but we're like, see, if you lose one of your senses, like sight or hearing, then your other senses pick up the slack. Now, I don't know if that I don't know if that's been scientifically proven or disproven, but I will say like uh, uh, you definitely as an audience member became hyper aware of sound because staging wise, because Alex obviously does a lot on the stage, but she is telling stories and kind of using the props she has. It really did also help that the sound was so evocative that it really did allow you to sink into this piece and really connect with what was going on. So bravo to, to that duo. Deanna and River, bravo to you both. 
Wonderful. I mean, before we get into our spoiler discussion, though, Alicia, is there any last minute co- notes you want to make? Would you recommend this piece to everybody? Kind of where do you like, want to give your kind of non-spoilery final thoughts on, uh, about this show? Yes, I would recommend the show to everyone. Mm-hmm. And in a way, I would say if someone's like me and likes to see theater and either doesn't have time to quickly take a look to see what's happening, what the show's about. I think this kind of show, you Mm -hmm. can just walk in and just absorb and take it all in. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, sometimes it is best to take a quick look of what the show is about because Alex is such a phenomenal person. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, yeah, I guess those are my final thoughts. I would say that since I was so convinced that Enzo was, he does a great job of, being a line reader slash in my brain, I kind of categorized him as the stage manager <laughs> because he just was so present within yeah. a role of like lifting up the piece and lifting yes. up the play. But then when I read his bio, I really took in that, okay, he is an actor. He is not a stage manager. Wow. Mm-hmm. So I just thought that was really interesting that I was yeah. I was pretty convinced. I was like, oh no, he's mm-hmm. he's part of the production team. Yeah. So I'm wondering if in if in, there was another production of this later down the line, if Enzo would have a different because that's his actual name, but I'm wondering what it would look like if it was if there was a character name that would come in um instead of it being the person that's taking on right. the, but that could kind of break that sense of familiarity and genu- genuineness because Alex mm-hmm. is using this is her life story so of course she's yes. going to use her real name so that's just those are just some thoughts on yeah. the side character Enzo mm-hmm. because he's such a presence as well mm-hmm. those are my thoughts <laughs> yeah those are very interesting thoughts I mean yeah I mean I mean Enzo is so wonderful because he took on the, char- the character of Michael who was mm-hmm. Alex's true travel companion as she was on this journey and then, and, and then, so it was so fascinating that, like, once again, I think it's, I, I, I'd be fascinated to be in that rehearsal space between the two of them because, because they alluded to kind of what he does, like, the line theater. And he asked her, Do you want me to further explain what I'm going to be doing? She said, No, it's okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. okay. They got it. So, but I would love to sit down and just get more details from him about, like, kind of what does he do with that script because he's up and down all the time. So, but he never misses a beat. Now, I don't know if that's because Alex is, because uh, she's memorized the show, kind of knows where she's got to go before, well, like, as Enzo gets back into his rhythm of feeding her the lines. So I'd just be fascinated to get more into what goes on between the two of them, because they have such a fascinating dynamic overall. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, final thoughts for me are just go see this show. I mean, I was talking to my parents and said, I would highly encourage and recommend seeing this piece, I mean, I mean, both, I mean, my whole family loves to travel, and just this is such a unique story that deserves to be mm-hmm. seen by as many people as possible. Because before this, I mean, I knew people who were visually impaired traveled. Like, why wouldn't they travel? But you don't ever really think about it in the way that Alex talked about. It. And I think that was what the beauty mm-hmm. of this piece was. It really gave you a sense of, oh no, they travel like everybody else. They'll go out and. You know, they'll go see the churches and the castles and, you know, go to the tavernas or go to a music concert and just visualize it and explore it in a different way than what we do. It's fascinating. And so I just really commend this piece for really opening the proverbial eyes of the audience who, you know, would probably never think twice about about this and probably would not have the courage that Alex had Mm -hmm. to really take on this venture. And so I just really recommend this piece. So once again, it's running... From June the 1st to uh, June the 25th. And it's playing at Crow's Theater. And the show is called Perceptual Archaeology or How to Travel Blind. So highly recommend it. Check it out. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be putting up our spoiler plane that is taking off. It is coming into play. And now, Alicia, the spoiler plane is in the air. It is on our screen. Ta-da! Fasten your seatbelts. You know, get your in-flight movie going, or maybe don't. Just watch us on, like, like on your flight instead. And just, you know, let's dive into this piece. So basically what we'll do, Alicia, is we'll go through each part. Because as we said, this was a five-part journey that Alex broke down for us. So we'll kind of go through each part kind of 
give a kind of a, our thoughts on each of the parts and kind of dive into them and kind of what our thoughts were in each of the parts and it, mm -hmm. uh, is there anything we would want to add to this kind of what can we have kind of what was our favorite elements of each part that type of thing there so we'll kind of get into that so part one is Alex kind of giving her backstory of kind of she talks about how growing up she was doing okay then as she got older her sight began to go she went to the hospital she got her diagnosis she then loses her sight at age 29 and then she was invited out to LA to see a friend after she had kind of spent two weeks at home kind of wallowing and, and kind of figuring out her next steps and so she does end up going to LA but she doesn't tell her friend she's going she just ends up at a hotel by the airport in LA because she wanted to kind of venture out on her own and that's where she gets into the pool and then basically from there she then starts thinking about her life she talks about her experience feeling the pool which is where we got that beautiful sound design as I was saying for being in the pool with the lapping water and then she kind of talks about how she came across this project of hers with James Holman who, who if you read if you want to check him out check out his Wikipedia page because it's fascinating. This man traveled through Russia, Siberia, Austria, Prussia. He also went to Spain, Portugal, Moldova, Montenegro, Syria, Turkey, the Americas, the Netherlands, Rhine, Belgium, Belgium, France, Italy, Switzerland. Like he went everywhere. So very cool guy. So basically she researches him, finds out, oh, there was another blind travel writer from the 1800s. However, he was maligned and his work was destroyed by society of that period. And so then she sets about uh, getting funding and getting the project going. And I think that's all in part one, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right? correct there, Alicia? Yes, yes, I believe yeah. so. I, I don't think funding comes in until we get to... Part two. Yeah, part two. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. So yes, yeah, so we're a little bit into part two there. Okay, so but part one, though, Alicia, so what were your thoughts on part one? And kind of the kickoff point to the story of this for like me, mm -hmm. for me for part one i was seeing the flow of how mm -hmm. the performance was going i was starting to mm -hmm. see enzo being more the uh, right off the bat there's the, enzo making a statement of the play and mm -hmm. visually describing what's happening and i in my brain i thought he was just going to sit down and not talk for the rest of the show <laughs> so it was interesting yeah. to see Enzo and Alex build mm -hmm. that dynamic throughout uh, at the beginning of part one we're also hearing more about Alex and travel and her thoughts on James Hol Holman as you said Mackenzie very fascinating man didn't know I didn't know about him until yesterday so that was interesting Same here so yeah for mostly for me for part one I was pretty much figuring out where the story was going, what was going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And I also immediately had a just a, a softness for Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at this point, right away, she also started to interact with the audience. Like yes, there wasn't a moment quickly. of, yeah, there wasn't a moment of that fourth wall where mm -hmm. we felt like we couldn't react. Because she mm -hmm. immediately said, if you feel compelled, feel free to laugh, stomp. Mm -hmm. Um, snap anything else snap so i thought that was really great that she just opened it up right away because mm -hmm. traditionally in theater there's that sense of i mean like laugh but also shush do you know what i mean yeah. like there's yeah. that so i like that this performance there was a sense of relaxedness to it yes but i could still focus on what was being said i still felt mm -hmm. for felt for alex when other parts of we'll get into it but yes it really is a journey so mm -hmm. thoughts on part one was it was just a great mm -hmm. it was a great starter to yeah. knowing who she mm -hmm. was knowing her relationship with enzo yeah yeah i mean i agree and once again this is a great base for the story because alex very quickly tells you her life beginnings and kind of losing her sight but then also kind of finding herself by going out to california and, I, and you are right alicia it's in England later on that she become, comes across James Holman when she's in England later on, when she moves mm -hmm. to England. So I jumped the gun a bit. So apologies, Alex, for not getting the parts right. If you're watching, hello. But yeah, part one, though, it's just so beautiful because it's an origin story, right? Like it's setting up, but then also poking fun at herself. Like uh, 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 she, make, she makes a very funny blind joke 
early, like early on in the show, which right away puts the audience at ease. Mm-hmm. Where, where she's where something like seeing the space or visualizing the space, and then she goes, "But not me." And then she, then it's one of those jokes <laughs> of everybody's like, "Okay, we're okay to you know, like uh, uh, there's gonna be funny things that happen to her in this piece as she's traveling, you know, and it's gonna be one of those things where it's okay." To react and have fun with this, but at least we're not going to treat her blindness or visual impairment as like a taboo topic we can't interact with. She's full on taking the bull by the horns and going, "No, no, no! This is not something to be like wallowed in. It's about you know, getting into the story and then enjoying it." Like she makes the joke about how when she tries to get a taxi, people speed away, and she makes a joke saying, "Well, it's not like my little dog's going to pee on your seat because she has a cane that she uses. She uses a cane." But once again, it's, but it's a seeing eye dog joke, right? Because there's some people who have a seeing eye dog and some taxi drivers are opposed to that. So, but no, it's a really wonderful way to kick off. And as you said, it, I was shocked when Enzo really started interacting with her because she would do the, hey, Enzo, I need mm-hmm. you for this. Or, hey, Enzo, can you guide me to here? Or, hey, Enzo, I need you to be this person now. And right away, Enzo's in. And so right away, you're like, oh, okay, this is where we're going with this. This, like, uh, this is where we're going to have some fun. So... It's a great, it's a great kickoff. And then once again, just the sound design of her in the pool and her describing having that moment where she had, where she discovered the pool. Cause she says, I got into the pool, but then didn't realize what the shape of it was, how deep was it? All that stuff. Mm-hmm. So she talks about how she went around the pool, feeling the edges, finding the cracks and like, it, and kind of where like, like parts of the pool were coming off, finding that it's a kidney shaped pool. And kind of discovering where the diving board was. And then all the time you feel like you're hearing the lapping sounds of the water is really a beautiful bit of artistry there. Once again, getting the audience in on the story and giving them that sensory kick that they need to really kind of feel what Alex was feeling in that moment. That tranquility, you know, and then coming to peace with, okay, I've lost my sight, but I'm not going to let that stop me. And then that segues us into part two which is where she says, I'm going to go off and explore England, which is something she hadn't done in a very long time. So she had no visual memories of it. So she was there. And that's when she is discovers James Holman, the explorer, and gives us kind of a bit of a small biography about him and how he would climb the mast of the ship and then swing out over the ocean to prove to, his, to, to, prove to people that he could do things, that he wasn't like an invalid of the boat. And, that, and just and so then she says, well, then I applied for the funding to to do this research project where I would travel in his footsteps. And so she does. And so that's what she and she ends up getting the funding. And that's all of part two is just her kind of finding that ambition of like, OK, what's my life project going to be? And so, you know, I mean, at least just what was like, kind of what, like, what were your thoughts on part two? For me, part two was that's when she was actually in. She got the funds. She was in London. Yes. And she was also with her friend Michael at this point, right? No, not yet. Mike- she gets Michael once she gets the funding. She goes to London first to live there on her own, just oh, to explore okay. the city. And then while she's there, she goes, well, I like to travel. Like, is there any such thing as a blind travel writer? Sure enough, she discovers through Wikipedia that there was this gentleman named James Holman, who was, oh, a, I see. Who, who was an 1800s travel writer. And then she gets the idea of, I could get funding for this by doing kind of the same explorations he did and kind of reclaiming the lost work, the lost works he did. Right. Okay. My yeah. bad. I'm getting a bit muffled with yeah. the parts, but so for part two, in terms of her really discovering James Holman, that was a fun little history lesson. Mm. I, I didn't know too much about James nope. Holman until yesterday, as I mentioned, yep. but it did, it did compel me to do a bit more research on him and just to see what he was about and Mm -hmm. I think her excitement for her excitement for just travel was Mm -hmm. I guess the word is it it was almost like infectious like I like she was excited Mm -hmm. I was excited that she was going to be able to get these funds and travel she has funds by now right we have established she gets funds funds at the end of part uh, of part two she gets funds at the end yes okay 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 yeah, so uh, once again, I think part two was just mostly hearing her thoughts on mm-hmm. on James and mm-hmm. also her excitement for being able to travel and going back to the UK and finding her way. 
and then there was the continuous yeah. interaction with the audience and i don't know if this happened already yet i don't there were there was moments in the play where she said can i get it can i get a round of applause please but i don't think it happened in part two so never mind yeah because uh, i was gonna say that was really effective mm-hmm. anyway i think i've shared my thoughts in part two i was just mostly yeah. just listening mm-hmm. it and hearing her talk about her her joy for being able to travel and her excitement for it as well mm-hmm. yeah i mean that's exactly it. like once again i did not know who this gentleman was so it's one of those things where you learn something new. Like I, I, once again, both shows I've seen at Crows recently, the Chinese lady and now this piece, have introduced me to two new historical figures that I knew nothing about, but now I was actively interested in in them and kind of what they got up to. I mean, just reading through the, through this gentleman's Wikipedia page and all the journeys he did, like turns out he was trying to explore the East, so going through Russia and beyond. However. The Tsar of Russia thought he was a spy. And so forcibly took him back to the border of Poland and kicked him out, basically. Like, fascinating wow. gentleman. That, like, <laughs> that, like, once again, he, he kind of comes to the third character of this piece. And so she does a really good job of setting him up as this kind of pinnacle person that she's really going to aspire to be like. And then that really does set her up for later on when she's going to figure out that this is a very overwhelming experience and that it's not, and she's not trying to be as fearless as him but trying to be as vulnerable and as open as he was and we'll get more to that in later parts but this was once again once again the part one part two are early on in the hero's journey as it were in in narrative structuring and so this was a great setup because once again now you're like okay so she lost her sight she's gained her ability to kind of you know live and exist in the world with this but then it's like okay now what's my purpose like what am i going to do and then now she mm-hmm. has the project. And so it's again, it's all great setup and it makes you excited to kind of see where she's going to go with this piece. And so I thoroughly thought this was a wonderfully well done part one, part two setup of the story. And then we get into part three, which is where kind of we get into a very meaty section of the show, which is she goes off to Germany and she mm-hmm. brings along her partner, Michael, who's mm-hmm. going to help her on her journey. And we get a great flying scene where he's trying to listen to music. She's listening to audio books from James Holman's writings. And she's trying to, you know, tell him about what he got up to. And he, he, Michael's like, oh, okay. <laughs> We're okay. <laughs> so yeah, so they fly out from England. They arrive in Germany. And then basically they're in Germany for a while. So she's, ex- she's out exploring. The first tour guide she has is just tell- <laughs> pointing at things going, there's a church, there's a bridge. I, 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 there's a tavern and Alex is going that tells me nothing <laughs> you know so <laughs> she has that so then the next day her and Michael go up on top of the hill of the city and they kind of get the general layout of the land she then travels to another town in Germany where this tour guide ends up like kind of slapping her hands on everything and once again very overstimulating so she's once again feeling this overstimulation and then she's seeing more towns. Like she said, she was going to try and see like at least 10 towns in two weeks. It was going to be a very exhausting, intensive experience for her. And sure enough, everything really hits the fan for her when they're in one of the towns. They're trying to get on a train. There, There's a sports match going on. So there's a lot of people getting off the train. And this is where this other big sound moment comes from, where her and Michael get separated from each other. And it's very overstimulating because... People are knocking her. Uh, her Michael, as I said, gets separated. Then they get on the train still. But she really does feel low at this point of the story and kind of shuts down going, I can't do this. I can't do this. Uh, and so she returns home to Canada for a bit. And then basically she comes up with a plan for part four, which we'll get into. But that's a lot that goes on in part three. That's like that's a very vulnerable moment of it and there's some great audience interaction there as well with the church cloisters too where she had us all sing which is a lot of fun but at least you're like what were your thoughts on part three for me part three that definitely was a heartbreaking mm-hmm. moment to see yeah. alex so i guess vulnerable and she talks about throughout the piece mm-hmm. so we get to see a bit of that fear with with her being visually impaired and mm-hmm. the way she described 
the way she described everything that was happening to her and then the sound cues that were coming in with all the noise it really painted a picture like I felt like I was in it with her so I think she did a really powerful job of creating that image for the audience and I think for me, part three, like, I just think about that incident. I, yeah. In my notes, I just put sensory overload, kicking, yes. yelling, barely making it on the train. It just really stuck out because for part one and two, everything's all, everything's great. Every Everyone's having a grand old time. We're all laughing. You see the relationship with Enzo and Alex. And then for part three, it's wonderful that she gets to travel with Michael. But we just start, we start to see those things that Mackenzie as you brought up the tour guide slapping her hand on everything and mm -hmm. the during other tours when it's just this is a church like just yeah. not she's not we're getting to see that she's not getting that experience that she's looking for she's not getting yeah. that James Holman experience mm -hmm. so we're kind of starting to see a bit of her shield break I can't think of a better metaphor but we're starting to see yeah, how, kind of her, how like, she personal is. personality like personal shield yeah, we're starting yeah. to just see things like just see how she is when she's vulnerable. And I thought that was yeah. great to see. And the sound designer did a, a wonderful job in opening opening that up as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, once again, like this part really stood out to me because of the train sequence. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I could, viscerally in my chair, I felt the uncomfortability and the tension of her losing Michael. And just the cacophony of that sound and that energy of people bumping you. And you, and I, 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 you know, we've all been on the TTC or local transit when it's busy, when it's rush hour and things kind of go awry. But I can't imagine doing it when you can't visualize it, but you're just hearing it and feeling it. Like, I can't imagine how overstimulating that would be. And that's kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back of the situation where you set out with the best of intentions and she admits it where she goes, I returned home feeling defeated, but it's because I came to realize that I like kind of what I set for myself was too ambitious. Like, like mm -hmm. It was just too much. And I mean, like, like even I, as someone who is not visually impaired would find that overstimulating of doing that much in, in that amount of time, like doing 10, 10 cities in two weeks. That's a lot to take in and, you know, kind of really, Take like, vi like like just mentally absorb. There we go. That's the right word. Absorb mentally absorb in you know. So that's something where I was where I really did feel for her in that moment where she was you know really feeling the struggle of that. And so, but at the same time, there, she brought this joyful energy to her to to it as well. Where like this was the part of the show where she left the auditorium and we're only hearing what's going on over the sound system because. For her, it was, you know, they leave the space and now she's in the cathedral. And so they're talking in there and then she ends up going to the washroom at one point. Like, once again, there was still comedy and lightness. Like, Alex never let the overwhelmingness or the defeat hinder the other mood of the show. Like, when she wanted for you to feel the overwhelmingness and the defeat, you felt it. But at the same time, she was very quickly able to turn it back around and go, okay, no, we're okay. We're moving forward. And I think that's what this this really did set up kind of where this next part of the story was going to go. And I mean, it's just fascinating. Like once again, like, I'm sure those tour guys had the best of intentions of being helpful, mm -hmm. but it's one of those things of they weren't helpful and it wasn't intentional, but it's one of those things where you're left going, yeah, you kind of whiffed the ball. These tour guides, like one of them was just completely ignoring her blindness, visual impairment. And the other tour guy was overstimulating that by having her touch and slap everything, you know? So mm -hmm. it's like two opposite ends of the spectrum, both with the best of intentions, but missing their mark completely. And I think that was, mm -hmm. it was something that really kind of reflects society where there are people on both ends of the, of the, of the spectrum of trying to help. But instead of them asking her going, what can we do to help you with this? They just assumed, oh, we'll go this way. And because she had Michael with her, who is someone who had who who was not blind? Uh, I, I, it's a very human moment there, and I really did feel for her and feel for the situation. So it was really well done, really, really well done. So I, I thoroughly applauded that moment. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah. All right. So she's home now. 
And she says, I got to regroup. And so she said, and so she goes back to one of her greatest stimulants, which is sound. So to do that, she decides in part four, she's going to go to the southern states to get the, to get the lay of the soundscape land there. So she arrives in, I think it's Atlanta, Georgia. And then she makes her way through Tennessee and Nashville. And she has this whole excursion road trip experience with her where they're going through different concerts, different soundscapes. At one point, her funders are asking, why are you in America? And she says, well, I'm well, well, one of these researchers of James Holman had said that he visited America, which is true, according to the Wikipedia page. So she was once again on, like, still on target, even though the people funding it didn't quite realize it at the time. Even I was like, how is she going to spin this one? <laughs> but it totally works. And so she gets this kind of great kind of rebound experience for herself, which is wonderful. And so we get we get a great car driving montage. She gets to play with the audio pitch dial on a sound machine as well. We get some Elvis in there too, where like where, where, where we visit the king's house as well. She doesn't she doesn't end up going. Michael does, but she goes me to a museum where it's like this is where Elvis sat. This is where Elvis ate that piece of pork. You know, ate that peanut butter and banana sandwich. <laughs> it's like she goes that does nothing for me. And that's her realizing her way into things, you know, like it's not just mm -hmm. always visually seeing something like kind of what happened in Journey where it's like, here's a church, here's a bridge, here's a tavern, here's a this, here's a that. And it's like, well, if it's only ever visual stimuli and not something else, like, like one of her greatest moments in Germany was in the cloisters with the choir. And now here she is in the Southern States where there's great rhythm and blues country music being performed. And so she's really getting stimulated that way. So this was a great kind of, once again, you feel the lowness, but then she turns it right around with a really great, fun experience there. So, Alicia, what were your thoughts on part four? It's interesting because for part four, part four, mm -hmm. um, I just wrote down in my notes, feeling saddened by travel. But correct me if I'm wrong, Mackenzie, but there is a moment when she's quite down. Is that, yes. is that in part four? Okay, that that's is. in part four. Because that that just really stuck out to me. So I find it interesting that you It's focus early more on in part four, and then she ends up going down to the States. Okay, okay. That is true. Because I do remember her also. I do remember the road trip, the driving, and how fun yeah. that sequence was. And I also have a clear memory of mm -hmm. her playing with the... It was like some sort of soundscape where her voice was changing. And yeah. so that was really cool. Yeah, and I think what you said really stuck out in terms of her finding her way of mm -hmm. uh, how she likes to travel, what ways that fascinate her and what mm -hmm. actually, uh, what works for her essentially, rather than, yeah. rather than the visual stimuli of this is a church, this is a bridge, actually hearing things or being able to feel the motion of things really, I, as an audience, I really start to notice, oh, this is what she really likes. This is when she's cracking jokes. I guess it's just the image of her laying down on her couch, which was also in in the play. They meant a, there there were there were objects in the play that would be other things, but and she would explain that, yes. and Enzo would also explain that. But anyway, there, there's just a clear image of her like being broken down for a moment in part four. So I don't know why that stuck out to me so much. I guess just the image of her lying down because she's so up and walking around throughout the entire piece so anyway uh, but my thoughts on part four by this time I'm starting to realize well earlier on actually I'm starting to realize how just the play is written itself mm -hmm. uh, because she mentions that she wanted to be a travel journalist am I right or some yeah something to do with writing and traveling yes so yeah, even, I, I, I mean, basically her goal was to be a blind travel writer a blind travel writer thank you yeah um so even the way the play is broken down into parts it reminds me of a novel so i'm assuming she did that in, on purpose instead of it being well also the play is 90 minutes so it is one act yeah. so instead of it being just one act and different scenes she because she could have said scene one scene two scene three but by part four i'm starting to think like oh this is feeling a lot like a novel so even with what she set out to do of being travel a blind travel write, novelist or writer. Right. I'm just really starting to see it. Really starting to see it within mm -hmm. the flow of the parts. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, like, this was the one section where there were a few parts where I would have loved a little bit more explanation of things. Like, there's one moment mm-hmm. where she talks about almost being pulled over. Like, I don't know if she actually ever right. did drive on the road or not. Yeah. I, I don't know if that was something where she was just visually dri- or, 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 or mentally imagining driving the car or her Michael actually like let her drive the car because I don't know if there is something there for the visually impaired or blind for driving I've never heard of anything but once again I am very un like, like, like uh, not very knowledgeable in this area so that there was something where I was a little bit confused but I enjoyed her energy in that where she's going through the radio dial and there's all the religious music stations. And she's getting, and finally she gets to uh, Tina Turner. I think it's who she got to, right? It was Tina Turner. Mm-hmm, uh, I think so. Uh, yeah. So she gets to there and then she tell, uh, but then she talks about almost getting pulled over. I'm like, wait, is this part of your uh, recollections and imagination? Or is it something that actually happened? Like, not quite sure. There was, I was a little vague on that. And that's something where I would have loved a bit more because everything else had been so well grounded and mm-hmm. straightforward, I was like, "Wait a minute, is she driving? Is she not driving? Did they get pulled over? Did they not get pulled over?" Because I mean, because I mean, you could have had Enzo play the cop that pulls her over and she right. talks her way out of it. You could have done something there. And then there's the other moment where she gets the email from the funders, where they very quickly wrap it up, where she says, "Well, he visited America, so you know." I mean, I would have loved a bit more because at that point I was like did she make that up? Like, is it something that like the historian said he traveled all the continents? Did he actually make it there? That type of thing. I would have loved her to give like a brief bio. Mm-hmm. Let's get talking about him exploring active volcanoes as part of his travels. But I'm like, wait a minute. Did he actually get to what we now know as United States? America? If so, what did he do there? Could we get any type of small detail as of right. what he kind of did there to kind of once again, tie it all back in kind of what he was up to. Just because, the, so that this was the one part where I was a little shaky, but it wasn't anything Alex did. It was more just, I would have loved more clarity in, in, in what was happening there. Because I loved all the elements, mm-hmm. like Alex was talking with the music and how that was stimulating. Because I'm like, yes, okay, so you're finding your way. You're finding your way of connecting with traveling. Because it's not going to be the same way that it was when you were younger and you could visualize and, or, and visually see all the areas. It's now got to find other ways to do traveling. And so this was a really big part of that was discovering sound is a big stimuli for her in this way. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I mean, once again, the music was great. The sound design was great. It's just, there were, there's just a few more moments in the session where I would have loved a bit more tightening up plot wise and clarity wise of what was happening here. But overall, yeah. though, I mean, once again, it's another great building block of the story. But then we get into the final part, which is the part I really found inspiring. One, one of the only ones I would love to do this where she goes on a big walking tour, where I believe she starts in Portugal. Wait, to Portugal? I think it's Portugal. Can't remember. I think Portugal was mentioned. I'm pretty sure yes. it was. Pretty sure yeah. it was. <laughs> yeah. 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 Portugal, Portuguese. Yeah. Portugal. And then she does a big walking, kind of like a trade route, like old cobblestone walking tour. And I think she ends up in Spain, Is if I'm correct there. She kind of makes her way and then ends up in Spain, I believe, is where she ends up in the end. But anyway, it's like a big, long kind of Lord of the Rings, Hobbits on a Journey walking tour <laughs> where her and Michael set off on this road. It's raining day one, but then along the way, she's meeting all these wonderful people. Every night they're in a different taverna that's on the side of the road. They're like running into people they met like two days ago, you know. And it kind of wraps up there. And at the end, she get she gets given a kind of piece of roof tile that is coral in color and coarse. And both Alicia and I got our little tiles that they gave us at the beginning. So this is where that all tied back into. So that was that. But, you know, this was kind of the big wrap up conclusion where she then ends with talking about vulnerability and how Mm -hmm. at the beginning when she read about James Holman, you know, swinging around on the mast over the open water, she classified it as fearless. But then she recount classifies it more as being openly vulnerable with your with yourself and with your journey and kind of how James Holman did this to show that not only was he a fearless person that could that was very able and capable but also that that he was willing to put himself in vulnerable positions and that's okay it's kind of where she kind of ties that all back together and it's a beautiful kind of wrap up to this piece 
So, I mean, Alicia, like, what for you? Like, this was the big final climactic part of the story. This was this was part five of this hero's journey. So for you, like, kind of where did mm-hmm. this land for you? It landed right in my heart. <laughs> and <laughs> it, for part five, even though the play and Alex was interactive with, throughout the entire piece with the audience, there was a moment in part five where she sat with us um, and also Mackenzie yes. and I were pretty close. So she, she was literally like, right in front of us. Like she was yeah. right in the room. Of, <laughs> like she, I, I believe she was right in front of me. Exactly. Yeah, she was right in front of you, right? And me too. She turned to the people sitting directly next to Mackenzie and just started to have a conversation. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I was so nervous. I thought she was going to start talking to us. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, I'm not doing that. But the people next to us were very open and had a lovely kind of mini chat. And then also they were giving out wine at one point or grape yes. juice. And there was one guy right behind us who was really enthusiastic about getting some of that grape juice. Um, oh, yes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that audience participation, that's always fun uh, there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's kind of, yeah. I mean, once again, this was just such a great wrap up. To, because yeah. It's all about recontextualizing your life. And not just, you know, you go in, go in assuming it's going to be one thing, but then you come back going, oh, wait, no, it's not. It's this. This is where I can do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And, and this is how I got to view it again, which is something we all need to reevaluate and do. Just because something fails or doesn't quite meet your expectation doesn't mean you pack your ball and go home. If this is a endeavor or a project you really believe in, you got to find new ways to go about it. And Alex was very much in that boat where the Germany trip didn't go quite according to plan, Mm -hmm. but she didn't just pack up her bag and go, nope, I'm out. She found new ways to tackle it. So she did such a great job that way and really contextualizing that and bringing that all together at the end. Because this was one of those stories where it's like, how do you wrap up the story? (laughs) Because exactly. Because she kept getting closer and closer to to 2020 and COVID. So I was like, are we going to get to COVID in this story? Like, where are we going? Like, where, like, where's our cutoff point? In fact, she ends it after this, concluding this big walking tour with Michael. It's a really kind of great spot to end it on. And it's something that was really a beautiful way to end the story. So I just love the piece. Like, once again, I, 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 as I said in the first part, I recommend this highly. I recommend it very highly. I encourage everybody else to go ahead and see it and experience this show. I mean, for you, Alicia, now that we're in the spoiler section, is there anything you... Wanted to say spoiler wise to wrap up your thoughts on this piece. Yes, actually, at the Ooh. end of it, there was a moment. So in the show, Alex lets Enzo do this boo yay game. Yes. So, for example, mm-hmm, for example, if she's close to where she needs to be, he'll say yay. If she's moving further away from her target, he'll say boo. So we right. mostly we just watched her do that. But at the end of the show, she or near the end of the show, she opened it up to the audience and said, hey, I need to head to the couch. Can you guys help me find the couch? So we boo yayed her to the couch. And right. I just found that to be a lovely moment of mm-hmm. interacting with the audience, but doing it in a way that just it was just a lovely way to I felt like I was just part of the play, part of the piece. It just felt very genuine to her. And mm-hmm. If if you're if you, I was gonna say if you're going to see the show, but I'm gonna switch that around and say please go see the show. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's heartwarming. The I the audience that was there that uh, yesterday, the day we saw it, everyone was so welcoming, and you could see other people who also had accessibility needs, as Mackenzie mentioned at yep. the beginning of this. So it was just a very heart heartwarming and opening piece, as well as. There was a, just a supportive vibe in the air. And it's also a show that I feel like I could see more than once. One of those. One of those mm-hmm. shows that I could see and get a different perspective on. So I think that's yeah. wonderful. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I mean, for me, once again, it was just uh, just like the Boo Yeah game. And just like Alex was really great at bringing us all in. The fact she came and sat with us in the audience at one point was just such a beautiful, interactive moment. And she was just so welcoming and, and inviting people into her story. And so mm-hmm. you just felt at home. And af- afterwards, I mean, we didn't really get a chance. We didn't get a chance to interact with her after the show, but she had all her friends and family and audience members who were coming up to her after the show to, co- to congratulate her. And she was, very, once again, very busy. So we just didn't want to disturb that. 
But she did such a beautiful job telling the story. Mm-hmm. She earns every bit of praise she's going to get for this performance in this piece because she's put together a really beautiful, beautiful production that really does touch the hearts of anybody who listens to it and really does encourage you to travel in a different way. I mean, now when I go to places, I will absolutely be actively listening more to my surroundings and taking in the sound and other stimuli, or that's a smell, things like that, that like you know, taste, things like that that you can do versus, you know, always relying on what you visually see on your journey. There are other ways of taking in your travel. And I think that was something that really I, I took away from this piece is just learning to be open to different ways of traveling and not always relying on what you visually see in front of you mm-hmm. was a really beautiful way to go about it. And yeah, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. Once again, it's a beautiful piece. Go see it, please. Support Alex, support the show. It's so well done. And I would, and I just highly recommend it. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pros, for inviting us. And thank you, Alex, for writing and performing such a wonderful piece. And Enzo and Leah, bravo to you both for be, for being such, a, and the rest of the crew and creative team for bringing this beautiful piece to life with Alex. It's just a wonderful, well done show all around. Bravo, bravo. Yeah. Alicia, before we go, though, where can people find and follow you? And where would you like to travel to next? You said you'd love to go back to South Korea. Uh, where are, are Alicia? Did I say Alex or Alicia at the end there? You, you said Alicia. I think okay, I cool. heard Alicia. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> uh, there we go. But yeah, no. So Alicia, let's wrap this up. So you can give, tell us where, like, kind of where we can find and follow you and where is next on your travel list you would love to go to. You can find me on Instagram. My Instagram is at it is Alicia Plummer. Feel free to follow me. Mm-hmm. Keep up with everything I'm doing creatively yeah. there. The next place I really want to go to is Ireland. Mm-hmm. I'm going to Ireland next year. I'm really Woo! hoping that's going to happen. Love it. Ireland's beautiful. Highly recommend it. Go kiss that Blarney Stone. I will. <laughs> <laughs> if they still let you do that, I don't know now after COVID if they will. But they do. They do. I've been watching YouTube videos about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. I mean, back in the day, they did not have the grate over the hole in the floor where you have to go and kiss it. So they, so I'm hoping they've updated some of the safety procedures since I was a <laughs> child and went to kiss the Blarney Stone. I love that though. And you can find follow me at Mackenzie Horner all social media platforms. You can follow my musical antics over at Before the Downbeat a Musical Podcast. And I will say my next place I would love to travel to is France. Everybody else in my family has been to France. My, my, both my sisters have done exchanges to France for the summer. And so for me, I would love to go to France. Victor Hugo is one of my personal favorite authors, writers. I've read Les Miserables, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. You know, Les Miserables, my favorite musical of all time. So I would love to go walk those streets and take in the art and the history that, that comes with such a beautiful country like that. So... That is, that would definitely be a place that'd be high on my list to go and see for sure. Also Scotland. I love to go up to Scotland because mm-hmm. that is definitely a place on my list that I have been dying to get to at some point very soon. So there we go. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you all in our next episode. Happy beginning of Pride Month as well. And we will see you all very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you all soon. Bon voyage.